Good afternoon, everyone. D Dean Stark and I are contemporaries, but our entry into nursing was accomplished in different ways. My original uh, degree in nursing was from a hospital-based diploma program. And Dean Starks was from an associate degree program. So we thought that might be the place to start. Why that was, what was happening, that, the, that different kind of entry was available, and those kinds of problems or circumstances actually still exist today. So Dean Stark, if you want to talk okay. about that, please. Uh, yes, I do, because I would like to focus today on the relationship between medicine and nursing and how that has uh, changed over the years, sometimes adversarial, sometimes very collaborative, and uh, to tell you some of the reasons for that and what I think we should do going forward. Um, as Adrian said, early on, most of nursing education was what you would call training and not really education. So you were trained in hospitals. Uh, the students had no college credit, no college education. It was all done in the hospital. Uh, most of those programs were three years, including summers. And let's face it, a lot of the students were used for very cheap labor to run the hospitals. Um, then in the 1950s at Columbia University, which was one of the only places that studied nursing education. Uh, there was a student who did her dissertation on what she called, uh, we should establish an associate degree in nursing. And that is someone who had some college education, but uh, who still had a lot of hospital-based clinical training. So happened uh, that the president of the college, the, the junior college, where in the town where I live, which was in the deep south, America's Georgia, where Jimmy Carter and that group is from, uh, that president happened to uh, come across the person at Columbia who had done this research, Mildred Montag. And he invited her down to Georgia, and they decided to set up the very first program in the state that would be an associate degree in nursing instead of diploma. There were in existence a few baccalaureate in nursing programs in the state, but I think there were just, just two at that time. Uh, so the associate degree concept was that you would have both college courses and nursing clinical courses at the same time throughout your educational program. And you'd graduate with an associate degree and then you could go on and add to that and get a baccalaureate. However, the state of Georgia says you have to have 36 months of clinical training for, uh, to be a registered nurse. So our associate degree program was 36 months in length which as you can count up is the same as a baccalaureate degree, 36 months. So uh, at, our, at our program, we both took classes and worked in the hospital. And it, we, we really like uh, went to class in the daytime and then worked the three to 11 shift. And we worked, we rotated and did all the shifts and had plenty of clinical experience. Uh, because we ran out of courses to take that are required for an associate degree, we uh, took extra courses and I decided to go ahead and take courses that would transfer uh, into a baccalaureate program. So I went ahead and took organic chemistry and some things like that while I was there. Um, I went on to Emory immediately after that and got my bachelor's degree. And in those days, you could teach in a nursing school with a baccalaureate degree. So I had one year of clinical experience uh, after my baccalaureate degree. Uh, but actually, I had so much clinical during my associate degree that I felt pretty experienced. So I took a teaching job at Grady Hospital, which is kind of like the Ben Taub of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, 
I want to bring in some uh, uh, racial diversity issues as well, because this was 1960s, and it was the Deep South, and Grady Hospital had two schools of nursing. They had what is called a white school and a black school. And I was low on the totem pole of teachers. I think I was about 21 or 22. So I was assigned to teach in the black school. And it was really quite a challenge. We had two schools of nursing, the very same, same curriculum, and pretty much the same faculty, but we were in separate places. The uh, Grady Hospital at that time was built in the shape of an H. And on one side were the white patients and the other side were the black patients. So that's kind of the environment that I came up in. And it was very strange in a lot of ways. We can maybe go into some of that later if you want to. But um, I saw right away after teaching for a year with a baccalaureate degree that I needed more education if I was going to remain in teaching. So I went back to Emory then and got my master's degree. And, uh, it, and did some other teaching. And then later on, I went, and went on and got my doctoral degree in nursing at uh, UAB. But I want to tell you what was going on in nursing education about that time. So a well-educated faculty member would have like a master's degree. And they were, there were not any, nurse, any programs where nurses could get doctoral degrees except this one at Columbia University, which you got an EDD degree. So that was the only thing available for nurses who want to get, a, <coughs> get more education. Um, those nurses were very steeped in how to write objectives, how to do lesson plans, all the educational methodology. So they kind of left clinical nursing and, if you will, moved into the ivory tower. And many of them lost their clinical skills. But I want I wanted to talk about this because I think it's very important. A group of nursing leaders then realized what was happening. And uh, a federal program was set up called the Nurse Scientist Program. And this program would take, would take bright students and send them for a PhD in physiology or a biochemistry or some of the sciences. Sociology, the whole gamut of sciences. <coughs> what happened then is a lot of those nurses left nursing and went to the other discipline. As I, as I mentioned, my education was in a diploma program, a hospital-based program. And I'm, I'm a few years younger, not many, but a few years younger than Dean Stark. And I entered nursing school in 1967. And when I did that, hospital-based schools were the majority of the programs for nursing. There were very few uh, requirements. Actually, the only reason that one would attend a baccalaureate program as opposed to a hospital program was that if you thought you wanted to teach or if you wanted to go into public health, which for some reason at the time required a baccalaureate in nursing. But if one thought that one wanted to do patient-centered care, one entered a hospital-based program that was a three-year program, September to September, and rotated through all of the disciplines. So when one graduated from that program, one was ready to enter the workforce and could work in a hospital with a pretty developed nursing skills. During this time period, there were there was much discussion about moving nursing education from these hospital-based programs into the university. And by the time I graduated in 1970 and started working in the early 70s, the movement to close diploma programs was really on its way and quite advanced. 
And over the next decade, the majority, the overwhelming majority of hospital-based diploma programs closed. And so nursing education started moving into the university. The associate degree program that Dean Stark entered was one of the ways that that could be done, or there were schools just operating um, uh, uh, baccalaureate programs, four-year baccalaureate programs. And by now, there, are, there may be a handful of diploma programs left in the country. I think there may be one or two still in Texas, but those schools are closed, most of them by the 1980s and nursing then moved into uh, the university. I think most of you probably have a, a medical background in this room. Okay, okay. And I think most of us are familiar with the format of nursing, of uh, medical education. You do your four years of college, you do your med school, you do your residency. Nursing never developed that way. It was always a catch-up sort of program. Remember that although medical schools were filled with men <coughs> and women struggling to get into medical schools, nursing schools were primarily women. And it was uh, thought for a, a long period of time for social reasons that women really didn't require that much education, for one thing. There were social constraints about educating women. And nursing has always been in the position of trying to move itself forward, but it's done it in incremental steps. So that nursing has not developed, okay, four years of college, four years of nursing school, and off you go programs have developed over time. First it was the diploma program, then it was the associate degree program, then the baccalaureate program, then the master's programs were introduced, and then to teach at the university, one was required to have a master's degree. And then doctoral degrees were introduced, and now to teach, you, re you are required to have a doctoral degree but there is still a very small percentage of nurses who have doctoral degrees even at this point. I think it's still under 1%, isn't it, of nurses in the United States with doctoral degrees. So it, that in itself is a problem because in order to teach, you have to have a doctoral degree. There's a shortage of, nursing, of nurses, but there's only so much faculty available in order to teach students. So the size of classes are limited because of the number of faculty that are available. And as the nursing schools have evolved, they have tried to meet the changing needs of healthcare, their students and their patients by developing different programs. So when you enter nursing school, you, there are various clinical tracks, there are different uh, programs of specialty in the master's program, and the doctoral programs uh, to try to meet the need. Nurse practitioners recently uh, to try to uh, provide greater access for entry into healthcare services for the population, but it has not been a smooth, this is the way we're going to do it and accomplish it. It has been a piecemeal, step by step, trying to get this done. Are you available? Okay. Yeah, I want to pick back up on this story about what happened in nursing education. So we had some nurses that got their doctorate in other sciences, and then they pretty much left nursing. Uh, about the same time, we had the feminism movement going on. Most of you are much too young to remember that. But there was a great movement, as Adrian said, that women need a, a good education. They need equal opportunity for different things. And... Um, 
there was this feeling in nursing education that we've already always relied on physicians to teach us. Uh, and most of my education about the condition, disease conditions of pathology uh, was taught by physicians, and then the nurse would come in and say, and this is the nursing care for this patient. So I grow, grew up in my education very comfortable communicating with physicians and asking questions and being a part of the, the team. Um, during this feminism time, it seemed to me that there was a great deal of anger in nursing being mostly female at the male gender period, but particularly at physicians. And this was the period where, uh, up until this time, the nurses carried the charts for the physicians. So if a physician came up on the floor and wanted to make rounds on, say, his six patients, the nurse pulled all six of the charts, and they were big metal flapped things, and carried those things around. Uh, the nurse was expected to let the doctor enter the room first, <clears throat> And also, uh, <coughs> if you were at the nurse's station working and a physician came up, you were expected to rise, to get up, and get out of the way. Uh, Dr. Hamilton, did you have any of those experiences? No. Did the nurses stand <laughs> when, you came, when you came up? <laughs> uh, so... Um, the feminism movement kind of said, you know, we don't need to be carrying the charts. Let them carry their own charts. <laughs> and they should be opening the door for us. We don't need to open the door for them. So there were, and we were then taught as students, you are not to get up just because a physician walks up to the desk. But if you're in the way, and you know physicians are in and out in a hurry, so you get, don't obstruct their work, but you don't have to rise and stand at attention. So some things like that began to change in nursing education. But during this feminism time, uh, kind of the unwritten culture became, we do not need physicians in our classroom. Every, everything we know in our discipline can be taught by nurses. So it was nothing but nurses in our classroom. And unfortunately, we still see some of that in some of the faculty today. They think, well, if we start having um, behavioral scientists on the nursing faculty, then pretty soon, you know, they're going to take over and we'll, we'll be second-class citizens again. So we still have some of that fallout, I think, that prevents us from uh, moving ahead in team-based spirit. With today's emphasis on in a professional education, you have to give team-based care. We've suddenly begun to ask ourselves, why are we educating physicians here and nurses here and other disciplines? And then when they graduate, they gotta work together. They've never worked together at all before then. So we're now trying to change the educational model back to, uh, to one of where we, we are learning together and practicing together and then working together when we graduate. Um, another thing that is so different now, when I was in school, uh, the nursing students were freely uh, <coughs> welcome to come to any of the med school lectures <coughs> and certainly any guest speakers and out of town professors and things like this. Whereas now, it's a, it would be a major effort to try to get nursing students to come over and listen to a lecture where you have somebody, you know, Nobel laureate here, and, and it's an opportunity for all of our students. So um, I think uh, we're swinging back now toward trying to work more together in disciplines. Another thing that should be of interest to you is that uh, when I was in school at Emory, and I was married by then to a medical student. And in his class, there were 60 students and only two females. <coughs> and those two, male, two females were very much an anomaly. 
and everybody's saying, I wonder how long they're going to last. And it was even like, you know, they're not going to last, so why don't they just go and get out of here? It was really tough on those women to make it. And today we're, what, 50% women in medicine. And I think that was, that was where we were going to move next, sort of in diversity issues in nursing. And first of all, looking at men in nursing and contrasting that with, med with medicine, as I mentioned earlier. It has not always been unusual for men to be in nursing in this country. Uh, men were in nursing during the Civil War that was not uncommon. The poet Walt Whitman, you might not know, was a nurse during the Civil War. Dur there was a terrible yellow fever epidemic in 1878 throughout the South, and many of the nurses during that epidemic were men. Uh, nursing schools started opening in the United States in the early 1870s, started in the Northeast, in New York and Boston, started opening Connecticut up there, and slowly moved uh, outward to other parts of the country. But when those nursing schools started opening, they were all for the education of young women. And so nursing in contemporary times has struggled to try to attract men back into nursing. And I know when Dean Stark was uh, the dean of the, uh, at UT that you had, uh, yes, and you had worked on initiatives mm -hmm. to try to attract men back to nursing. Maybe you mm -hmm. could talk about that. A I think the national average uh, is still under 10% of uh, nurses are male. Many of the uh, Male students are going into anesthesia, emergency trauma. Some of those fields, I think, are very attractive to males. But we occasionally have a male who wants to be a neonatal nurse. So it's uh, we should not stereotype, of course. But we did target some of our recruitment to those things that we felt like uh, would attract males. In fact, we asked a, a group of male nurses in the medical center to advise us on how we could improve our recruitment. And one of the things they said is, you gotta change all this flowery language in your brochures and everything. <laughs> so nursing is caring and nurturing and this and that. We wanna hear that you know you save lives and on the, the trauma aspect and the fast paced, high tech, all those kind of things. So, we did some changes in the way we recruited and how we recruited, and we were able to really boost our, our uh, male enrollment. But looking back at the history of the development, both of medicine and nursing, you do have to stop and think, what was going on socially that nursing became such a female role and medicine was such a male role, and how we have managed to create change in some area of that. And so it's really fascinating to look back at the uh, role of feminism, what that uh, played in nursing, mm -hmm. but really this is not a huge time frame. And it's sometimes helpful to look back and think, okay, we think nothing ever changes, but it really does. It may be slower than we want it to be, but change does happen and it's helpful to look back to see why that did occur. Another area that we sort of mentioned was attracting other minorities right. mm -hmm. into nursing, and medicine probably reflects the same thing, mm -hmm. and maybe you could address what was done well, in that. Um, at, the, at the time when I was in nursing school in the late 1950s and 60s, um, there were separate schools, and I don't think we had any male students whatsoever at Grady and the, either of those. Either. In fact, I remember uh, I was teach a young teacher, and we had our first uh, male student in nursing, and all the hospitals were saying, "What are we going to do? We can't assign any pa female patients. We can't." Well, when you take care of OB, you don't have much choice. You know, you got so. Uh, 
this this male student was assigned an, like an 80-year-old woman to give a bed bath to and everything. So he came back and it was just, off, the hospital was like, what he did, what? And it was just really big deal. And he said, well, you know what? She'd had a double mastectomy. There was nothing to see anyway, for goodness sake. So it was um, those kind of things you look back now and think, that was so strange. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't think about that at all today. Um, diversity of, uh, racial diversity is uh, something I think we're still working on. Uh, we have done a better job at the baccalaureate, the entry level, but we're having a hard time getting those students to uh, go on for um, higher education so they can be faculty because students need role model faculty. So the best strategy we have found is kind of to handpick students and say, you need to go right on to graduate school. Um, many of these uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds, regardless of uh, racial background, are first time college students. And they are very interested in getting an education and starting to work. And once you start to work and you get a car payment and you get a house payment and all these things, it becomes more difficult to go back to school. So we've tried to do a better job with getting scholarships and loans and also saying to these students that we tap on the shoulder, um, while you're used to being poor, go on to graduate school and get it over with, get it, get it done. But we, uh, I think the Hispanic um, nurse population is just a little over 10%. Um, and black population is probably much better, I don't know percentage-wise, and it varies certainly by state as well. Um, but I would say 77 or so percent of nurses, nursing workforce is still white, Caucasian. And then another thing that we talked about was the big changes that we are seeing currently that affects medicine as well uh, concerning technological development, simulation, how that is used in nursing these days and what a change right. that has been over the years for right. you, Absolutely. what you have seen. Well, up until the last 10 years, I would say the only kind of practice mannequins we had in our labs were those uh, still life dolls, life-size dolls. And yes, they had, uh, you could do IV, they had rubber arms that you could practice IV and they had other things that you could practice, catheterization and all like that. But it's been in the last 10 years that we've gotten the high uh, fidelity simulation mannequins and the possibilities are wide open. Again, what we've developed on this campus and in most campuses, the med school has a lab, we have a lab, uh, the dental school has their lab, and we don't do anything where we could do team-based practice. For instance, we need to practice a code that is students from the different disciplines because this is what you're going to encounter in reality. So we are trying at this point to say, even though we have separate labs and transportation of students across all these buildings is very difficult, we need to have team-based simulation training in certain things. And how would you say that technology has impacted nursing education? Oh, from uh, our early days. yes, from our early days, uh, I don't think we could have even dreamed of some of the things that we have now. And it, uh, it just keeps growing exponentially, as you know. But, um, and that's one of the arguments I like to use when we think about nurse practitioners and the increasing scope of practice. There was a time when only physicians took blood pressure. And uh, as we moved along, it's like the physician said, the nurses, you take the blood pressure and I'm going to do something else. So we're now at a stage where the nurse practitioner can do a lot of things that only physicians used to be able to do. Why not 
let everybody function to the maximum of their education and training. So we need to constantly change who handles what kind of technology. There are some nurse practitioners at MD Anderson do some very high-tech procedures. And, as, and, of course, they are trained and credentialed and so forth to do those things. But uh, we're constantly going to have to adjust to technology. And what do you see the role, because we hear a lot about the role of the nurse practitioner, especially under the new health care situation. We do not have enough, nor will we have enough with our present educational system to ever meet the needs of the high demands for an increase of access that is people who have insurance that now can uh, have a primary care provider. So to me, the only way that we're ever going to hope to address this is to work in teams, physicians with nurse practitioners, and physician uh, specialist with generalist nurse practitioners who can take care of the patient's other kind of needs. We've got to work in teams and we've got to let everybody practice to the utmost of their capabilities. And so you see the nurse practitioners as the entry point into the healthcare system? Uh, not necessarily, not necessarily, but a, prim a primary care provider whether it's physician or nurse practitioner or PA. And looking back over your 30 years as dean of the UT School of Nursing, when you reflect back on that, what do you see as the greatest changes that have happened in nursing education? That's uh, a loaded question and many, many answers, but I think the biggest change is the number of uh, avenues that a nurse can take. In other words, we have grown so many different kinds of ma master's specialties. And could, could you talk about that a little bit, about the different programs that are available? Right. Um, well, in our school and in many of the larger health science center schools, uh, there's um, gerontology, which we've now combined with adult, because it's like if you take care of adults, you're going to be taking care of geriatrics. So those two are now combined. Pediatrics, uh, neonatal, adult, and then there's women's health, and, and some have developed an adult mental, a men's health program. Uh, then you have all kind of super specialists, cardiovascular, uh, nurse specialist, neurology, uh, oncology, forensics, and it just goes on and on. The doctor of nursing practice is another innovation. Yes, Tom? Could you tell us something about how you came to be the dean? Like, how did you get to be the dean of the school of nursing? And how did that develop over the years? Because you were the one who built this school into one with a national reputation. But I'd like to hear the personal side of that. Well, I think all of my career moves, a lot of them have been serendipity. And it's, I'm not one of those people that sat down and said, let me make a five-year goal or a ten-year goal. Um, and I think what I have done is be open to opportunities and, and seek out opportunities. So how I got into administration period uh, from being a faculty member was... Uh, we had a very tough situation in Georgia, which I can go into if you need detail. But I was um, asked to consider that position. And I remember at the time I was making 13000 a year. Can you even imagine that? <laughs> and I kind of flippantly said, uh, well, I might do it for 20000 a year. And they said, you got it. I said, what? <laughs> so that's basically how I got into my first administrative job and I found that, that I liked it. I liked the problem solving. I liked like having to deal with a lot of things at the same time. And then again I only had the master's degree at that point. So pretty soon I realized if I'm going to stay in this I'm going to need a doctor. So that's when I went back and got the doctoral degree. And at that point um, when I got my doctorate at Alabama 
my goal was to find a position under a very top-notch dean of nursing and try to learn in that situation. I kept looking for those kind of positions. And uh, my, uh, the associate dean of the program said, I think you ought to look at this program here, which is you would be the dean. I said, oh, no, I'm not ready to be dean. I want to go. But she said, well, look at it. And uh, if, if you decide you like it, I'll help you with all these things. So I, I did go and look at that program as well as others. And uh, I really liked it, and everything fit into place. My family situation, everything was like, oh, wow, this looks like it's meant to be. And so I took that position, and I would call that associate dean at the graduate program in Alabama from time to time, say, oh, well, I can't believe what this, what happened. And she would walk me through some of those things. And then I remember I had a, I needed an assistant dean. And I called my mentor and I said, I think I would like to take the assistant dean position and let them recruit, recruit somebody else. This is just too much driving me crazy. And she said, no, you can do it. You stick with it, you can do it. So anyway, I finally uh, got to where, okay, this is doable, and I kept, I kept at it. And I stayed there five years, but it was an academic campus, and I missed the medical center environment. I missed, as I said, I didn't like having to read about something instead of being where it was happening. And that's when I started looking around and came upon this position here. And that, that's a funny story, too, and I know we need to wind up so they can have some questions. No, we have time for questions. Okay. Okay. Um, so I had been at Alabama for five years and decided I wanted to go to an academic health center. So I was interviewing in uh, California, and uh, they had called me and said, would you stop by Houston and look at this on your way back? And I said, Okay. So I'll go to California, and it's right after Proposition 13, which was where they voted, uh, the state voted to basically cut funding for higher education. So I went to California, and they put me up in a dorm room, and they said, uh, well, sorry, we can't take you out to dinner, but there's a place you can walk a couple of blocks up here to get your dinner. And uh, so it went, it went like that the whole time. And... Then I came back through Houston, and they put me up at the Shamrock Hotel over here that had a pool the size of a swimming pool, and I had a suite. I, I called my kids and said, guess what? I have a room that has two televisions. <laughs> and uh, it's really the royal carpet kind of thing. And I met with the president, uh, who was Roger Bulger, and he had called me and said, uh, if you don't mind, we'll meet at the hotel instead of over at the campus. And I said, okay. So uh, he came over there with the chair of the search committee, and they said, well, if you don't mind, we'll, after breakfast, we'll go up to your suite and talk. And I thought, hmm, this is a little bit funny. Okay. So we went up there, and he said, uh, now the faculty don't know that you're here, and I don't want to tell them that you're here because... Uh, I had, they had a search committee and they gave me a name of somebody that, and I met and I, we just didn't have chemistry. So this time I'm going to find the person and then I'm going to let the search committee go through their process. And uh, <laughs> so the president and I hit it off and we, and he actually made me the job off at that time before I'd ever met with the faculty. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, one of the things that he said to me was, there's not anything that you can't think to do that we can't find the resources to do. Now, after being in California <laughs> and after being in Alabama where we couldn't afford coffee for the faculty meetings, that sounded pretty good. And, you know, basically that has proven to be the case. I was just going to ask Pat to tell what she's done to increase the number of doctoral faculty that are available in the Gulf Coast region. Most uh, nurses that get their doctorate work and go to school. So they work full-time, they are family responsibilities, all those things. 
So it takes them about seven years to go through a three-year program because they're going part-time. So we devised a program. We actually copied one in California uh, where uh, a foundation had given UCSF $9 million. So we decided to try to do something like that in Texas, but we had the hospitals and others come together and pool some money for about $3 million. And what we did was we selected a master's graduates and we said, we want you to go to school full time and finish this program in three years. And then when you graduate, you got to pay us back three years of teaching. And then we hope they'd stay longer than that. We, we gave them $60,000 a year to go to school full time. They could work one day a week because some of them were nurse practitioners and they needed the practical experience. But we started that program, we had 10 students, we graduated all 10 of them, they all 10 came on faculty. And so we immediately were able to expand enrollment in other programs we needed. The next year, Rob Wood Johnson decided to do a program like that and now they have picked that up and they do that. But they have, uh, they give out the money and the a school has to match some of it. And the students don't get quite 60,000, but uh, they have now put that program in all over the country and everybody's getting these three-year accelerated programs. I wanted to know, um, how has the big rise and in interest in being a nurse practitioner changed um, the, the nursing school, the applications to nursing school? Have you seen much of a change with that? Because I know a lot of people in college were trying to get a nurse practitioner um, and it was really tough for them, so I guess it's really competitive now. I wonder if that's taken away from applications. To the I, let me answer it two or three ways. One is it did take away um, from application to, to be a nurse educator because it, it's not just the program itself, but the salaries they make when they graduate is so much different. Who would want to go into one when you can go into the other and make, you know, almost twice as much? So we had to come up with some innovative ways to, to get faculty. So we do faculty, you can teach part-time and practice. So they would have the best of both worlds. Um, we created, uh, we applied for a grant and there was, there were only five in the nation given and we got one of them in Houston. The, they give the money to the hospitals and uh, it's sort of like graduate, how many of you are medical students? You all know what GME is, right? Okay, for, for, it funds your residencies. We created, uh, we got, the feds created a uh, graduate nursing education program to see how, how would this work if we did the same thing for nurse practitioners as we do for residents. And, um, the way the program is set up is they give us money to pay for the clinical training of additional students to increase the students. So in our uh, area, we said we were going to increase by 100 graduates a year. And we, had four, we have four schools that are involved because one school couldn't do it with that many. So um, we said we were going to increase by 100 a year. Guess what? We increased at least four times that much. Because what the Fed's program was, if you take them, we'll pay for them. They didn't say, we'll give you this much money and you have to make it last. They said, you know, you get more of them, we'll pay more. And was that nurse so practitioners we, or just This nurses? is advanced practice nurses, okay. which includes nurse practitioners, uh, clinical nurse specialists, nurse midwives, and nurse anesthetists. So basically, yes, we've increased enrollment greatly, but we've been able to accommodate those. That federal project runs out uh, in the end of 2016. So we're already lobbying to try to get that made permanent. Maybe just to close, where, where do you say that nursing is heading? Well, think I think it's, it's on one of the best times ever in the world to be a nurse. I think that the challenges are there. And the wonderful thing about a nursing career is you can do so many different things. You know, you don't have to work in a certain place and do a certain kind of routine. There are so many different options for nursing. But I think uh, particularly with interprofessional, 
uh, emphasis and practice. The, the nurse is the coordinator of the team, pulls people together, keeps people organized and moving ahead. And I think that's going to be a great responsibility and role for the nurses ahead. Well, thank you for coming out of your sick bed. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about this. <laughs>